Hello and welcome to the Ask the Expert series on cloning. My name is Eric Gage and I'm a Senior Program Manager at ServiceNow. Hello everyone, this is Xue Jia Lu. I'm a Senior uh, Developer in ServiceNow. I'm working in a Cloud Infrastructure Development Team and then mainly focused on clone projects. Before ServiceNow, I was a developer in Microsoft. Hello everyone, my name is Xiao Yi Ye. I joined the ServiceNow at 2012. I am software development engineer in cloud infrastructure development, focused on cloud automation. In today's session, we will show you three videos that will walk you through how to define and schedule a system clone, how to check the clone status, and how to cancel and roll back a clone. After watching the videos, the experts will be available via the live chat Q&A to answer all your questions. Thanks for watching. The System Clone application allows you to clone a ServiceNow production instance over an existing sub-production instance. Typically, you would do this to develop and test changes without affecting your production environment. In this demo, we'll walk you through the typical cloning process that applies to most situations, explaining the choices that appear on the System Clone form, and then we'll cover some less common options. We're already logged into the instance that we want to clone. We'll call it the source instance. A clone is always initiated from the source instance. To run system clone, you must have the clone admin role, the URL of the target instance, which is the instance to receive the clone data, and the administrator username and password for that instance. To allow a clone, the target instance cannot be a live production instance. Also, it's glide.db.clone.allowclonetarget property must be set to true. By default, this property is true for all instances whose name end with dev, test, stage, UAT, and QA, but false for other instances. To check or change this property on the target instance, navigate to the sys underscore properties table and list records whose name contains clone. Here's the property we want, and it's false, so we'll change it to true. Now, we'll return to the source instance. Before cloning to a target instance for the first time, you must create a record for that target. Clone targets allows you to do that. You only need to do this once for each target instance. Here, we'll enter the URL for our target instance. And in these fields, we provide the credentials for a user account that has the admin role on that target instance. If you want to create records for multiple target instances, for example, development, QA, and UAT, just add a new record for each of them. Now we're ready to request the clone. For the target instance, we can either enter the URL or click this icon to look it up. And here's the target record we just created but if we hadn't done that, this list would be empty. No problem. We could just click New, which would display the same form we filled in earlier, allowing us to create a target instance record without leaving the system clone form. But since our target instance is already listed, we'll just select it. For most cloning needs, at this point you would simply click Submit to initiate the clone, because the rest of these fields are all preset with defaults. But let's take a look at them, because there may be cases where you shouldn't use the default settings. The first one is selected to exclude audit and log data. That's because the production instance usually contains a lot of data that isn't necessary for developing and testing new features or system changes, so it makes sense to exclude it from the clone. The excluded data is listed in the Exclude Tables module shown here. You can add or remove tables from this list. If you wanted to include the log data listed in the Exclude Tables module, you would clear this Exclude checkbox. But we want to exclude it, so we'll leave it as is. The same deal applies to attachments. If you want to exclude large attachment data, such as video and binary type files, leave this checkbox selected. But if you want the clone to include attachments, clear it. Theme refers to the instance look and feel. 
user interface elements such as cascading style sheet, colors, and banner displays. It's common practice for administrators to give their production, development, QA, UAT, and other instances each a distinct look so that users don't accidentally interact with the wrong instance. By default, this checkbox is selected to preserve the theme on the target instance, that is, to keep it the same as it was before the clone instead of replacing it with the look and feel of the source instance. If you want the theme from the source instance to overwrite the theme on the target during cloning, clear this checkbox. But be careful, since this could cause confusion about which instance users are logged into. A clone must be scheduled a minimum of four hours in advance, which is the default date and time setting. The system does not allow you to schedule it any earlier. This built-in delay allows time to upgrade the target instance, if necessary, before cloning begins. If the target requires a downgrade, that won't start until clone time. The delay also provides an opportunity to notify users of the scheduled clone. You can schedule the date and time for the clone to begin by entering the values in this field or selecting them from the calendar. And finally, this field specifies who will be notified when the clone is completed or canceled. The email address of the logged in admin is automatically filled in, but you can add or delete addresses for notification. And to schedule the clone, just click Submit. Before continuing, the system requires that we authenticate administrator credentials on the target instance. And then it verifies that the target instance is available, we have administrator rights there, and ServiceNow can write to the target database. Finally, we confirm that we really want to overwrite the target database. And that's it. Our system clone is now scheduled. The Clone Definition section of the System Clone menu allows you to specify at the table level which source data to exclude from the clone and which to preserve on the target. You can also create and run post-clone cleanup scripts. Let's take a look at these modules beginning with Exclude Tables. When scheduling a system clone, if you select Exclude Audit and Log Data on the form, the tables to be excluded are listed in this module. By default, all of these tables are excluded. But you can include any of them in the clone by removing them from the list. For example, we want to include the sys email table to clone existing emails from our source instance. And you can exclude additional tables by adding them to the list. We'll exclude the CMDB CI table to save clone time, since ours is a very large table. Excluding a table results in an empty but usable table on the target instance. Data on tables that reference the excluded table, such as business rules, are not excluded. The Preserve Data module allows you to preserve existing data on the target instance by storing it before the clone and restoring it afterwards. Here are the default data preservers. There are two types user interface look and feel, and core. In most cases, you won't change the user interface preservers. Since their theme field is set to true, they only run when preserve theme is selected on the system clone form shown here. Let's take a look at one of them. If the theme checkbox is selected, it is a theme related user interface preserver. A clear checkbox would indicate a core preserver. This is the table whose data are to be preserved. And conditions, if applicable, are defined here. Now let's go back and look at the core preservers whose theme value is false. These run every time you clone the instance, regardless of whether or not you preserve the theme. For example, this one ensures that your email, POP3 and other core instance properties are always preserved. So if there's a particular table on the target instance whose data you always want to preserve during the clone, you would define a new core data preserver here. 
we'll add a data preserver to preserve the admin users on the user table. First, we'll give it a name. Since this is a core data preserver, we won't select theme. Here, we select the user table and set the condition roles is admin. After we submit this, our clone will preserve admin users on the user table. Keep in mind that data preservers are primarily intended to preserve system settings and themes. They do not automatically maintain extended tables, nor do they preserve relationships and hierarchies between tables. Cleanup scripts run automatically on the target instance after clone completion to perform any action that can normally be accomplished through script includes or business rules. Here are the cleanup scripts provided by default. Their functions are described in the ServiceNow wiki. You can delete any of these that you don't want to run, and you can add scripts to perform other actions. Let's just take a look at two of them. ServiceNow disables email on the cloned instance because we don't want email messages, which appear to be real, going out from a subproduction instance. If you always want to enable emails on the clone, you could delete this cleanup script. But a better alternative, to control this on a case-by-case -case basis, may be to go into the email settings on the target instance after the clone and enable email there. Since text indexes are not cloned from the source to the target instance, it is necessary to regenerate them after the clone if text searches are to work properly. It's good practice to check the clone definition modules before each clone to make sure your system clone turns out as expected. The Clone History module allows you to check the status of your clone, cancel the clone request if necessary, or even roll back a completed clone. This list provides an overview of some clone-related fields, including state. Most of these states are self-explanatory, but hold may be confusing, so we'll explain that. A state of hold means that the server rejected the clone request either because the clone was not ready to proceed by the scheduled time or the request was submitted before the previous clone request was completed. By design, the system handles only one clone request at a time. This is because it takes a while to clone an instance and if an error occurs, you don't want to duplicate that problem to multiple cloned instances, for example, development, QA, and UAT. The system rejects all clone requests submitted while a previous request is still pending or running, so you must wait for one clone request to finish before submitting another. If the previous clone is not yet complete when you request another one on the same or a different instance, the system displays this error message to remind you about the one-at-a-time request limit. And the request state is set to hold, which is a permanent state since the request will never run. So if your clone request ends up in the hold state, just wait until the previous request is complete and then submit the request again from the request clone form. You cannot resubmit it from the existing record. You can open any clone request record to view its details. For example, here are the settings used to generate this clone. And here's the data about the clone, whether it's completed or active, when it started, and so forth. You can also check which tables were copied, and if the clone is still active, this list updates dynamically. It's perfectly safe to cancel a clone request at any time, because cloning doesn't change anything on the production instance. And even if the clone has already started, first it copies to a staging area, and then from there to the target instance. You can always reinitiate a clone request after canceling by going through the Request Clone module. To cancel, just open the clone request and click Cancel Clone. We won't cancel this one, but that's how you would do it. For a period of 24 hours after clone completion, you can roll back the clone to revert it back to its pre-clone state. The Rollback option appears in the clone history as a related link in the completed clone record. 
Here's our clone, completed less than 24 hours ago. When we open it, the rollback option appears in the clone history as a related link. As long as the link is here, we can roll back this clone. Let's see what happens when we do that. The system confirms, and when we return to the clone history, we see that our clone's state has changed from completed to rolled back. That's how you check the clone status and cancel or roll back clones. Thank <laughs> you.